14. John chapter 14. We look at verse 25, John 14, 25. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you know somebody? Somebody will come to mind when I, when I make this statement. Do you know anybody who, when you're around them, they have an atmosphere of chaos? <laughs> so don't raise your hand. You have an atmosphere that, when you just get around them, they're always negative. And when you walk in the same room with them, they just begin to bring you down. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody come to mind? We all have those people in our lives, and if you can't think of anybody, it might be you. <laughs> but, I mean, it's just like, it doesn't matter what they do, it's always down. Oh, oh, horrible. And you walk in the same room with them, and you be like, yeah, and then you just start running down, too. And the last thing you want to do is be in that room with them. They have no peace. They have no peace because the atmosphere controls their peace. Their atmosphere that they created or the atmosphere that is created around them controls whether they have peace or not. We're going to continue our series today. If I point to yourself and your forehead, your identity, we looked at that. Now we're going to look at our peace. Seven things the enemy wants to steal is our peace of mind. The second thing is this week we're going to look at is peace. Look at John chapter 14 verse 25. Now I'm going to read through this and then we're going to go backwards, okay? Because I think Jesus is setting a he's, he's telling us something and he's setting a foundation and he's built, he's built on that. It's like uh, well, I explain as we go on. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Now this is Jesus speaking probably from the upper room, getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to die. He knows that. He's getting ready to lay down his life for you and I and his disciples that he's directly speaking to here. He says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before, before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he, is nothing, he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go. From here. Sorry, I'm going to turn this slide. There we go. I said, I'm getting older, my eyesight's going bad. Verse 27, he mentions peace. Verse 28, he mentions, he said, if you knew I was going to my Father and coming back, you would rejoice. So there's, there's joy there. And then in verse 29, he says, I've told you all these things so that when they come to pass, you will what? Believe. So you have peace, you have joy, and you have faith. But then he's laid a foundation there in verse 30 and 31. Let's look at that. It's like a building. You have your foundation and then you build on top of that. Without a good foundation, everything else falls apart, right? So he lays this foundation here in verse 30 and 31. He says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world. Who's that? Satan, the enemy, wants to steal these things from us. One is peace, right? He says, the ruler of this world, the enemy is coming. And he was literally coming because we know that he entered into Judas, right? And Judas is getting ready to head to the garden. And he said, the ruler of this world is coming. And he could have easily said, the rule of this world and Judas 
who's in Judas, is coming. And he has what? Nothing in me. He has nothing that he can point to and say, Aha, Jesus, you're guilty of this sin or this and this. I've got this against you. You've had this. And Jesus says, he has nothing in me. Nothing. <laughs> Jesus lived a lived sin, sinless life, right? He says, I have nothing. He has nothing in me. He's coming, but he has nothing in me. Verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Now, Jesus had already said earlier, he said, no one takes my life, but I what? I lay it down of my own accord. He said to Pilate, Pilate said, don't you know, when he stood before Pilate, he said, don't you know I have the power to release you or to have you crucified? And what Jesus said, he said, you have no power over me unless it's been given to you from above. What was he saying? I am laying my life down. You're not taking it from me. And so Jesus lays this foundation for his disciples for peace. He says, the ruler's coming. He has nothing in me. He has no accusation he can come. And what's he saying in verse 31? Let's go. Go where? To the garden. He's on his way. He's marching. He's marching to Calvary. Voluntarily laying his life down. It says while he was on the cross that Jesus said, Father, into, my, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he what? Gave up his spirit. He laid it down. What's he saying? He says, I told you these things beforehand. What things? One was, I'm going to die and take up my life again. Remember that? I tell you that ahead of time so when it happens, you'll know that I'm in control. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Now listen. He said, I'm telling you all this so when it comes to pass so on the third day and all this comes true, you're going to know either I'm a really good guesser or I'm in control. And what he was saying is, I'm in control here. I'm in total, total control. This thing isn't just happening by chance. The, the enemy isn't in control. It isn't like that. And Jesus is saying, I told you in advance so that you could trust me. Now let's go back. Verse 29. I told you all these things so that you might what? Believe. Why can we trust him? How can we trust God? How can we trust Jesus? Because he said, I'm in control. And I'm going to prove it to you. If he's in control of his own death and resurrection, do you think he can handle the problems that you face and I face? You bet. He says, I've told you all these things so that you may believe. And then he says, in verse 28, he builds on top of that. He says, you have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice. If you knew what was happening here, it would bring joy to you. It would bring joy. In Hebrews 12, too, it said that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross and the shame, and despising the shame. The joy that was set before him. And I've said this before. What is the joy that was set before him? Was it the cross? Hey, I just go to the cross. Was it? No. It was what lay behind the cross, on the other side of the cross, which was what? Salvation for you and I. And because of that joy, it, do you remember last week when we talked about Romans 8? All the groaning that was going on. It said that the earth groans and we groan inwardly and the Holy Spirit groans in intercession. And we said Christ groans for us. What was that all the groaning for? For that day you and I would realize our full salvation. Right? And it was because of the joy that was set before him that he had. And Jesus says, if you knew I was going to my Father and coming back, you'd have joy. Why? Because you believe what I've said because I'm in control. Now he's building. Do you see what I'm saying? you got the foundation. Then you've got the faith. You've got the joy. Because if you can trust Him because He's in control and you believe Him, you can trust Him. And because you trust Him, it brings joy. And because you have joy, He's going to pile something else on top there in verse 27. Peace. But he doesn't stop there, does he? Look at what that says. You got your Bibles? Look at that. Peace I leave with you. What's the next word? My peace. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. 
let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he takes the foundation. I'm in control here. You can trust me. You can have joy. And because of that, I'll give you my peace. Let's just go home. That's not good stuff, is it? <laughs> he says, listen, he says, now I know the NIV has plurals. But it's singular in the original language. But Jesus says in verse 27, let not your heart be troubled. That's singular. But he's talking to multiple disciples. What's he doing? I believe he's speaking to each one. Speaking into each one of their hearts. Let not your heart be troubled. Just like in John chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I believe he was speaking each to each and every one. And I think you can put your name right in front of that. Mark, don't let your heart be troubled. You can put your own name right there. Don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because I have his peace. See, the world offers peace to some degree. It's its own kind of peace. We, we can find peace in the world in, from a retirement fund or a retirement account, right? You lay up a nest egg and you have that. That brings some peace to know that when you retire... It might be there when you, I mean, bring some peace. Health insurance, uh, a bomb shelter, uh, safety nets. It's good to know the police are around when you need them. And they bring some sense of peace, right, and the order. Our relationships bring some kind of peace. But it's a peace that the world gives. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you a peace, but not like the world gives. I'm going to give you that kind of peace. I'm going to give you my peace. You see, when you start chipping away all those things that the world gives you peace in, the retirement account, take the police away, your peace leaves. If that's what you're basing your peace on, right? Jesus said, I'm not giving you the kind of peace that exists when those circumstances and your atmosphere is going really well. See, Satan doesn't want your stuff but he wants to mess with your stuff so they can take your peace. John 16, 33. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you that in, in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Why? Because he's in control. He's in control. And we can trust him. Philippians 4, 7, that it's a peace that passes understanding. We're going to get to that in a moment. But he says, I give you my peace. How do you get that kind of peace? Well, Philippians 4 7 says, Meditate on these things. Write that down, uh, Philippians 4 7. And look at that later. He says, Meditate on these things. Whatever things are true, whatever things are just, whatever things are noble, meditate on these, and the God of peace will guard your minds and your heart. Another way we have this peace is, is through prayer, I truly believe. And listen, 1 Peter 3, 7, we're studying through, we just started a series on Wednesday nights so going through 1 Peter. But 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. If you want God to answer your prayers, I believe in any relationship, you can't have a relationship that is in chaos. Because your prayers will be hindered. It's plain. It's simple. What is it? Confess our sins to God through prayer. Or you will have no peace. Stand on the promises. Look over at Mark chapter 4 quickly. Mark chapter 4. And I'm going to read you this account here. That's good, Philip. We're going to be here for another hour and a half. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Everybody just relax. We're not going to be here that long. Mark chapter 4, verse 8. See, the, I, don't, I don't take that much time and I get blamed for it. And I don't start till 1130. And David's in the back going like this. <laughs> Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, as he was and, 
and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, speaking of Jesus. And what was he doing? Asleep on a pillow. Sleeping like a baby during a storm. I mean, that's bad when the, the water's coming up over the sides of the boat and it's filling up the boat. Where's Jesus? He's sleeping like a baby in the stern. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, Jesus rebuked his disciples. Now, I was thinking about this as I was getting this ready. I was thinking, now wait a minute. They did what you and I would hopefully do in a storm. If you're facing a storm, what are you going to do? I would hope you go to Jesus. I hope you go to God. Right? And they went to him. Even though they said, hey, dude, don't you care? You don't care about it. They went to Jesus, but he rebuked them. You would think he would say, guys, you came to the right place. But he didn't say that. He rebuked me. He says, Where, where's your faith? <coughs> Jesus did what I think he expected them to do. Was speak to the storm. Now, by that is this. Sometimes, you know, there's nothing wrong with coming to Jesus, obviously. There's nothing wrong with coming before God. But sometimes, instead of speaking to God about the storm, maybe we need to speak to the storm about our God. I mean, serious. Why did he rebuke them? For the same reason. Remember when Jesus fed the multitudes? He said, you feed them. And what they do? Well, all we got, Jesus, is a little boy's lunch here. So Jesus, all right, set them down. I believe Jesus wanted them to start pulling out of the bag and start feeding the multitudes and let them experience the miracle. Please don't get me wrong. The power doesn't lie within us to stop the storm. The power lies within whom we serve, and that's God. And I think also we need to be filled with the Spirit, because the fruit of the Spirit is what? Peace. His peace. Some of you say, well, Mark, you're talking about Jesus who, who is asleep on the storm. Of course, he's, he's God. Of course, he's going to sleep in the storm. Don't forget, John 14, Jesus said, My peace. <laughs> My peace. Scriptures make it plain that if the, if the band will come. See, the scripture says that it's a peace that passes understanding. It means. I heard one preacher describe it as crazy peace. It's an insane peace. It's a peace that is unexplainable. You can't explain it. It's a, it's a peace that when you have it, it's like people look at you and think, you've lost your mind. You're going through this storm and you, are, and you have such peace. How, did, how can you go through that storm and have such peace? Are you crazy? It's that kind of peace that is available to us that so many times we let the circumstances in our atmosphere control what we're going through. We get these things stripped away from us and we begin to lose our peace. Why? Because we're allowing our, we're drawing our peace from stuff. And we've got to stop doing that. Hey, remember the person or people that we were talking about at the beginning? Whenever you're around them, they had there's chaos. Now listen to me. If you leave them or you're in their presence and you say, I just can't be around them anymore. Because they what? They bring me down. 
Well, guess what you're doing? You're allowing them to take your peace. So really, our mindset's really not much different than theirs if we're going to allow them to steal our peace. So let's not do that. Let's draw our peace from where the source comes from. How can you face death? How can you face whatever the circumstances, the finances are falling apart, everything, relationships, whatever, whatever the storm may be? How do you face that? have his peace. It's available. And I truly believe it's just like wisdom. When he says any of you lack wisdom, ask and it'll be given to you you know, abundantly above. I think it's the same way with peace. When my grandmother passed away, we all were gathered around her bed. One of the most, you know my grandmother, many of you know my grandmother, one of the most godly women, people that I know. And we were all gathered around, and as she took her last breath, we were all gathered around, and and there was there was still, even though she passed away, there was still such a peace. How can we have that? One, we knew where she was going, but two, we had that inner peace that God gave us. And do you realize that we were even even right after that, there was a moment where we were we were even able to laugh. We had such peace. And you may think, that's just no, 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 no. See, we knew she was better off than we were. But but I remember my aunt Carla, she was, they were by the bed. Sam and I was talking about this last night. We were by the bed, and, and Carla had my grandma's hand, and she passed away. And of course, we were, we had peace, but we still were mourning. We still were, were crying. We were still in that state because we're selfish, you know. We didn't want to believe. But I remember she passed away, and we were all, we had this moment together with our family, and we were, we were sobbing and praying and, and everything. And then all of a sudden, my Aunt Carla, she said, huh. she moved her hand. She was holding my mom's hand. <laughs> In the moment, uh. and we just started rolling laughing. We knew, we knew my grandmother would think that was so funny. How could we laugh in a moment like that? Because we had peace. We had true peace that passed. I can't explain it to you. I can't explain it other than it's a peace that passes understanding. I, as a pastor, great orators cannot. Paul could not explain into words what this peace is that is available to us. He couldn't describe it. He just said, passes understanding. I'm not even going to try it. Not even gonna try, not even gonna try to explain it. There it is. Peace. <laughs> it's amazing. Passages of Scripture. Jesus says, I am going to send you out as sheep to the wolves. Why? How can we do that? Peace. I think of uh, the uh, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. That's many of your, maybe a favorite psalm of yours, but I was, well, listen to this. Listen to this. But this doesn't bring peace. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Doesn't mean things. But the things that I need, I'm not I can bring peace, right? Doesn't matter if things are falling apart around me. I will not want. He makes me to lie down in green, green pastures. He leads me beside what? Still waters. It's just so Peace. He restores Christ. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. Why? Because He's in control. For you are with me. I'll never leave you, no percent. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And here it is. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't know if you think about that or not, but our peace, God is in such control that he'll sit there, he can set up a table in the presence of your enemies through the chaos, through the atmosphere of chaos, you can sit there in all sincerity and peace and eat in front of your enemies. That's how complete it is. 
when's the most vulnerable time for somebody who's in the who's who's on the front line? They know when you're going to eat or sleep. You're most vulnerable in those times, right? Because you're not as aware of what's going on in the battle. So you have others that are watching for you. But Jesus says, I can give you the table in the presence of your enemies. You don't have to worry about it. Why? He's, he's laid the foundation. I made the trouble. Just believe, have that joy, and you'll have my peace. Crazy peace. Insane peace. You know what? Let me think crazy. You stand. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, that's where the peace comes from. And I'd like you to come. If you have any other need, I'd invite you to come with me.
beyond that, we thank you for the, the Holy Spirit, the comfort. We call him the comforter because he brings peace. We pray right now for your peace that you would fill us. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your peace. And Lord, even though we can't describe it, we just pray, God, that you just help us believe in your today with that. And no matter what happens as we walk out these doors, no matter what the atmosphere is, we just pray, God, that you would help us not be controlled by that that we would speak to the storm about how big our God is.